Democrat Senator Sheldon Whitehouse is my guest. Senator, welcome back. Thank you, Gene. Uh, we're going to get to the daylight saving time in just a bit. By the way, kids don't run around anymore in their PF flyers. They're, they're inside <laughs> on the games. But we'll, we'll let you think about that for a second. We're taping on a Friday. The president at any moment is expected to pick up the phone and call his Chinese counterpart, uh, President Xi, and say, you better not get in bed with Russia, and you better not have any designs on Taiwan, and you better not this, and you better not that. And what's China going to say? Oh, we're so afraid. No, but I think that when uh, China looks at the response that President Biden has orchestrated mm -hmm. through the entire NATO alliance and beyond to Russia's attack on Ukraine, whatever he may feel about President Biden, he sees this unity in the West and he sees the massive power not only of government sanctions, but also of the follow-on through the uh, global corporate mm -hmm. sector of McDonald's saying we're closing all our restaurants, we're done with you, of banks saying we're pulling all our loans, we're done with you. So I think um, it, it's, it ought to give China pause yeah. about messing around with Taiwan. It's a little different, isn't it? China can say, oh really? Well, we're not going to buy your debt anymore. Oh really? Well, we're, gonna, we're not going to ship you yeah. all the cheap stuff, cheap, cheap stuff we sell you. A little different than, little than different, Russia. But still, you have this unity that I think is quite compelling, mm -hmm. and I do give President Biden really good marks for reassembling that unity after essentially President Trump's right. efforts to vandalize NATO. If China goes after Taiwan, what do we do? Well, that's, a, that's, that's an Armageddon. That's a, it, yeah. it, it could well be. Yeah. What do we do? We hope they don't. What do we do if they do? I don't know. Depends how that's they a, do it. That's too many you know, I appreciate too many that honest answer. That really would yeah. be the tipping point, I think. How do they the go after it? Do they do what they did to Hong Kong and slowly squeeze yeah. out the foreign capital, slowly squeeze out freedom? Mm -hmm. Do they actually launch bomb strikes the way Putin is doing against Ukraine? I think those differences make a big difference in the answer. So we wait and see. In the meantime, we're preoccupied. We wait with and see, but we build and com continue to restore yeah. and, uh, and strengthen this Western alliance that has come together so effectively against Putin. And if China does give uh, Russia uh, weapons to finish off Ukraine, and if they really are in bed together, and if this and if that, then what do we do? That's a, that's a more present yeah. issue. I think the likelihood of that is very slim right now. Mm -hmm. I think the Chinese have taken a big lesson from this. Uh, from what I hear, they're also very upset and disappointed with Putin, because when they were having their public marriage mm -hmm. and how they were going to be friends forever and in front of the world clasping each other together. Nobody from Putin's team bothered to tell the Chinese, oh, and by the way, a few weeks from now, yep. I'm going to be rocketing civilians. I'm going to be blowing up mm -hmm. children. I'm going to be knocking down maternity hospitals. And I don't think the Chinese appreciate his lack of candor. All right. Everything you just mentioned is a reason why uh, the Ukrainian President Zelensky begged you. You were there in that yeah, gathering, absolutely. joint gathering of Congress. He begged you individually, the president, please give us a no-fly zone. Yeah can't do that. Very hard to do that without starting World War III. Yeah. Um, but what we're working on is trying to make sure that he can control the airspace as effectively as possible. It began with the Stinger missiles. They've taken out, you've probably seen the videos, mm -hmm. helicopters and aircraft with the Stingers. There are anti-aircraft systems that are more complicated that reach higher up to higher altitude okay. bombers that the Ukrainians know how to use and have been trained on. And they are located in other NATO countries. And my expectation is that those will be brought into Ukraine. So they have that added yep. anti-aircraft support. So you're going to give them money. You're going to give them weapons, more sophisticated weaponry. Doesn't this, doesn't this put us in a de facto war with Russia? You're sub I'm giving you the gun. Go ahead. You shoot. Look at Vietnam. Same thing. Same By the thing. way, that's your area. You're, but it, you're, you're, yeah. I understand your family history serving there. Yeah. But it didn't turn into World War III, which is important. And I think that um, right now what we have, if I have one point about all of this, it's that we should consider the prospect that the Ukrainians can actually win. And I've been pressing the administration to consider the prospect of Ukrainian victory. It was always, will they last three days? Will they last five days? Yeah. Will they last two weeks? No, there's actually a real chance that is increasingly acknowledged by General Wesley Clark, by the historian Francis Fukuyama, by Ann Applebaum, an expert in this area. Yeah. These guys could actually win this well, thing. Well, those three, they haven't been the staples on cable news, but now this is the first I'm hearing someone expand that you think 
uh, they can win this war because everybody else I hear says they're going to get exactly. crushed. They're going to exactly. get crushed. You think they could win? I think it's hey, a you're making news. Go it's, ahead. It's a real enough prospect that in our planning mm -hmm. as a government, we should contemplate that prospect. And what makes you think that? Because they are actually asking the Chinese for weapons? They're, they're, uh, they're, 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 from what we see, 7,000 They're asking Russian the Chinese cost. for weapons. They're trying to get Syrian soldiers in. They're seeing their own soldiers defect. Every single one of their assaults has been repulsed. They've lost probably north of 10,000 soldiers. Mm -hmm. And they're having to resort to bombing civilians because when they have a fight with the Ukrainian military, they lose. Yeah. Isn't the truth the first casualty of war? Do you believe the reporting you're getting? Maybe you're getting better reporting than me. You know, I'm not sure what to believe. Some people well, are saying, look, look, look at to believe. He's put on a few pounds. Maybe he's <laughs> high on steroids. Maybe he's, 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 you know, he's not himself. Well, that's true. I can, I can tell you what not to casualty. believe. I can tell you what not to believe, and that is Russian disinformation. And there's one person I'd particularly like to salute in your line of business. Yep. And that is the woman who came onto the screen of the yes. Russian TV station yep. with her sign saying they're lying to you. I don't think she's going to do very well in the future, but God, was that a brave thing to do. Senator Sheldon Winehouse continues our conversation. Senator, uh, the man you replaced in the U.S. Senate, Lincoln Chafee, surfaced about a week and a half ago to say, you know whose fault this is? It's the West's fault for pushing NATO right up against uh, P uh, Putin's door. And he said, you know what he's going to do. And Chafee says, I'm right. I voted against Iraq. I'm right. Now listen to what Senator Chafee said, and you can react. And now Putin's invading Ukraine because he's saying, you're pushing NATO right up to my borders. And when you say NATO, that means military bases, it means missiles. And he's saying, you've already invaded Iraq. Now you're pushing NATO up against my border. And he warned us. He said, I can't abide by that. Is he right? Was this a calculated mistake the West has made? Uh, I, you're still friends with Senator Chafee. Yes. Yes. Um, and with his family. And I just think he's mistaken on this point. Well, he said, I, he said, I expect you to say that. He said, but I was right about Iraq, and I don't care what anybody else. He said, you're going to see I'm right about this. Is that possible? I think the fundamental flaw in that argument, which he's not the only person to make, there mm -hmm. are several Republicans who are still out defending Putin. Right. Um, but I think the fundamental flaw in that argument is that NATO has always been a defensive alliance. And what Putin is doing in Ukraine is not defensive. Again, he's bombing civilians. He is terrorizing civilian cities. He is sending artillery salvos into maternity hospitals. NATO is designed to protect against that kind of behavior. It's not designed to mm -hmm. do that kind of behavior. And so for NATO to creep up against Russia, <laughs> the merit of that is actually proven by this incident. He's not attacking the NATO nations because that defensive alliance deters right. him. He's attacking the children and the women and the civilians of Ukraine because it's not protected by the NATO umbrella. But the idea that he's threatened by the NATO alliance, I think, is just fundamentally, factually wrong. You think he's threatened by a pro-Western democracy at his door? Exactly. Okay. What he's threatened by is the comparison between a capitalist, yeah. democratic, free Ukraine and the despotic society that he's increasingly created. That his That's a comparison he cannot survive. That his own people can see Precisely. from a high hill. Precisely. And have families and okay. cousins and in-laws. You don't think he's going to go after some of the NATO nations on his, on his borders? He's not going to go after Poland. He's not going to go after some of the others. He's a very reckless person, and he's cornered right now, so I wouldn't rule anything out. But I think the important thing is to make sure right now that we support Ukraine, help them win a victory if they can, yeah. and help make sure that whatever gets negotiated is defended against. We, remember, Ukraine, we promised to defend them in return for them taking down their nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So we can't... We can't violate our promises to Ukraine a second time. Let's go to the pain we're feeling at home. The president was kind of softening us up. Well, you know, if we do this, it's going to be pain at the pump for it all is. of us. Yeah. And we saw 439 yeah. a gallon, maybe a little higher than that. By the way, South County, I don't know why, has higher gas prices than other parts of Rhode Island. You're in Newport. I don't know if you've noticed that in your travels. Uh, whose fault is it that we have higher gas prices? The president calls it Putin's price hike. Yet Joe Manchin, the Democrat from West Virginia, disputed that. He said there's a lot of blame to go around. There is a lot of blame to go around. Um, international fuel prices are set by a fossil fuel cartel that includes Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and mm -hmm. others, Venezuela. Um, American companies choose 
to follow the pricing of the international cartel. Nothing requires the prices to have gone up at the pump in Rhode Island, except that the big oil companies jacked their prices to track the international oil market. Prices aren't skyrocketing because their costs of pumping in Wyoming yeah. skyrocketed. They're skyrocketing because of what happened to the international market as the uncertainty around Ukraine and Russia as a supplier spiked those prices. Gas prices were going up long before the Russians put their people out the border. The first thing President Biden do, did when he got in office was he stopped the pipeline. I know you're going to say the pipeline's got nothing to do with the media crisis. It has you're nothing right. to do with it. But he cut off drilling uh, in, on the federal lands. Uh, he restricted fracking. Uh, he said nothing on the ANWR. Now listen to your fellow Democrat, Joe Manchin, yeah. from West Virginia, laying yeah. out the president <laughs> and saying, let's go, let's drill. <laughs> For the superpower of the world, we should not be dependent on Iran or on Venezuela to start producing oil, the dirtiest in the world, when we can do it here in America. Uh, he, he's basically saying, come on, it's his, nonsense. His, this is Biden's price hike. His, he's wrong about that, but his point fundamentally is right. And that is, as long as we're dependent on oil, we're dependent on foreign forces that set the price of oil. The sooner we can get to a renewable American-based economy where the prices are not driven by foreign cartels, that's when we finally have the security that he's talking about. There is no such thing as energy independence when you have an international price set the way you do in the fossil fuel market. Is, well, have to move to renewables to get off this treadmill. How long have we been on it now? You and I are old enough to remember the gas uh, shocks of the 70s. I do. Odd and even license plates. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> when do we learn? Yeah. Get off the damn stuff. Um, do you agree, accept the premise that under President Trump, we were a net oil exporter, we were more energy independent than the President Trump, and the first thing Biden came in was cut off that and ruin it, and that's why we're, we're more dependent. Actually, I've been com <laughs> complaining to the uh, Biden administration that they have not been strong enough on their promises. We are, I think, at a uh, export high, um, and we've got a lot of drilling going on, and we have a domestic oil industry that has thousands and thousands and thousands of fallow oil fields that is just not bothering to drill. If it needs to drill, go to the fields you already own and go drill. Yeah, they say, well, those thousands of permits, that, that's business as usual. They don't know if the gas is under there. They want to go where they know it's a, it's a, they've got it. That's what they count. I think you've heard that. This is, this is your area as well. Yep. Yeah. And I think that at the moment, the key is to move as rapidly as possible to renewables. The oil industry is always going to say, you name your crisis, and their answer is going to be, you need to let us drill more. You want to put a, a uh, you want to put, well, what would you call it, a penalty, a tax? Windfall profits tax. Windfall profit tax. Yeah. And you've got some co-sponsors. No, no yeah. Republicans so they've got, on board not, for that? No. no, not yet. <laughs> so you've, you know, the costs are here. Yeah. They're about the same as ever. And the price used to be about here. And then along comes this international incident and drives the price up to here. Mm -hmm. And Exxon's now talking about making $100 million in profits. So uh, my take is, yeah. as long as you're soaring your profits, Share it with the American public. Give some of it back. And so we'd split the difference. They'd keep half of their excess profits, but the other half would go back to the American people. So they've got a check. So when they go to the pump, they've got some money to buy. You drive an electric car. You I also do. have gasoline cars as well. I do. And I, I have an electric many. car. I also have other gasoline cars. Was it tone deaf for the administration, uh, Secretary Buttigieg and others to talk about, why don't you buy an electric car? They were you doing know, that, and a lot of people said, I can't afford gas in my car I have now. How am I going to put the down payment for an electric car? Wasn't that tone deaf? Probably, because people are facing an immediate solution, yeah. immediate problem, and switching to electric vehicles as a long-term solution. Also, these new, like the electric Mustang, the electric Ford F-150, right. they are sold out. They are making them as fast as they can. Yeah. So when you're asking people to get into a market that is pretty maxed right now, I think that's not a good immediate response. But in the long run, is it the right response? Absolutely. Of course, nobody, nobody Absolutely. debates that. By the way, nuclear energy is the right response in the long run. You told me that last time you were I'm on. the leading... How come you don't talk about that more? How come I don't hear anybody else but you talk about <laughs> nuclear well, well, energy? Those are two different questions, Gene, because I actually do. I'm the leading Democrat on most of the bipartisan nuclear legislation. We have... Well, I have to watch C-SPAN more then. That's where, I, <laughs> that's where I hear you. But I don't hear you in the mainstream media. No, no, no. Sheldon's the nuclear man. No, there's... Uh, I'm the 
lead Democrat on most of those, and they're um, small modular nuclears that can be run. The Navy's run them without incident for mm -hmm. years, powering submarines and powering aircraft carriers perfectly safely, so we can advance that technology. There are also newer technologies that would allow us to go through the nuclear fuel waste that now has no plan and that is just stuck at the facilities where it was burned and go back and turn that into power. And that's a double benefit. First of all, you get clean, renewable power out of it, no emissions. Mm -hmm. And second, you begin to chip away at the nuclear waste problem that we have by putting it back into service. Well, no, I mean this. You know, you're, so you're saying I've got the solution. It's nuclear. It's technology. We it's have. a piece. It's, it's safer. It's a piece. We could do it safer today than we did it years ago. But how come I don't read about that? I don't see Ted Cruz whacking you because you've been tweeting about nuclear power or going well, after you and nobody else talks about this it. This is bipartisan. So Ted Cruz would be whacking me on the partisan stuff. Yeah. You know, he's a oil state guy. So when I come out against his oil state mischief, obviously he comes to uh, do battle with me to defend his yeah. oil state patrons. But um, there's not a lot of disagreement here, so there's not a lot of conflict. And so not a lot of yeah. fun for him to come and fight with me on that. All right, let's talk about inflation. You know Larry Summers, used to be the president yes. of Harvard, uh, former President Obama's top economic guy. He's blaming yep. President Biden for inflation. You put too much money out there. You overheated things, and now look where we are. Highest inflation we've had in decades. I have a slightly different view. I think that a lot of the inflation is driven by supply and demand. Everybody knows about the laws of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. A lot of money did get out and it really helped American families and it put them into buying mode and that created demand. But the supply chains had been broken by COVID. And when you have a supply demand imbalance like that, prices go up. So we need to address it. We're trying to address it with this windfall tax bill for prices at the pump. We're trying to address it by knocking down pharmaceutical prices for families, yeah. and we're trying to address it by helping people with a really burdensome expense that they have, which is child care, elder care, care for people at home. Right. If we can do those three things, that will make a very big difference in people's pocketbooks, and they're also the right things to do. Oh. And we're trying very hard to do that, unfortunately. Yeah. against Republican opposition. Well, give Larry a little bit. He's the top economic advisor. He said you threw too much money out there. Is yep. that also, and there are lots is that of, also there, a factor? There are lots Look of different opinions about this, and there may have been too much money put out there, but that's a quality problem to have. Remember the difference between how people were uh, able to respond economically with all of the funding that's gone through to the states, yep. all the funding that's gone through to families, compared to back in 2008 when we had the mortgage meltdown. And people, I still to this day remember the pain and the anxiety mm -hmm. and the fear in Rhode Islanders about losing everything. Yeah. Families lost their jobs, they lost everything. And there wasn't the support there for them. The Republicans blocked the Obama plan to provide the support that they wanted. This time, the support was more robust. People got through it fine. The after effect of it is the supply demand okay. problem, and we're trying to address it as hard as we can. It was robust. At some point, you were giving people in the restaurant industry, technically, they're making $60,000 a year on unemployment. If you looked at what, what you were giving away, and we couldn't get them back to work. So you could see this notion that we're a little too generous. By the way, well, I, I understand your, your thinking on that. Let's move. You gave a billion dollars in uh, relief to Rhode Island. We still have most of it sitting up in the bank. Who is that for? Because every advocate has got their hands out. Uh, Senate, uh, Speaker Shikarchi told me there's $7 billion worth of asks for $1 billion to give away for the homeless, for affordable housing. How about everybody who suffered in the pandemic? How about me? How about you? I think that the decision was to send money to the states and to let the state governments and the municipal governments spend the money as their local needs justified. So I think it's totally healthy that groups are coming in and people are coming in right. and asking their legislators, hey, here's where we need the help and here's where the money should be spent. And the legislature took time to listen. They're working on it right now. They've put out the first tranche through Governor McKee. They're reaching agreement on the rest of the spending. And the same thing is happening at the municipal level with all of our cities and towns also making those yes. decisions. Yes. To me, that's very healthy, and that's where the decision-making best lies. Shikarchi pointed out a lot of these uh, cities and towns are flush with cash as well. But there's a notion. Why don't you... Uh why don't you cut the federal gas tax? Why don't we cut the state gas tax? Why don't we end the excise tax and property, property tax on your car faster? Wouldn't that help everybody? 
Everybody, regardless of how much you make, everybody suffered. Is that, do you agree that, with that as a premise? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I think what the legislature is doing could yeah. very well cause better and more broad benefits to the Rhode Island public. And it's their job to figure that out. That's why we elected them. And I think they're going to do a good job of it. Senator, you were a big proponent of leaving the clocks as they are. No more daylight saving time. You said let the no, kids run around. More, in the, more daylight well, saving time. Yeah, but time. don't change the clocks. No exactly. more changing Permanent it. daylight right, savings time. Let Bingo. the kids run around in their PF flyers. They don't do that I anymore. I didn't say PF flyers. Well, we, I'm just looking at our generation. And we, and we, our want, converse, we want kids to play outside. Yeah, but, you know, there's people who push back and say it'll be too dark in the morning when they get up and go to, and go to school in the winter. Have you heard the other side? There's no thing that you can do these days that's good enough that somebody isn't going to complain. But let me tell you, this is hugely, hugely popular, which is why it passed the Senate unanimously. So you're saying there's no argument here. Do you believe it to pass no, the House? No, I think there are, there, there are arguments on the other side, but I think the, the very strong balance is that there are more people out mm -hmm. between 4.15 and 5.15. There are more people who see that day in November where the clocks move earlier and you right. lose your, your uh, evening sunlight, who f hate that day. And I think uh, that's the response. I hope the um, House will pass it. And it is crazy, I think, to switch back and forth, switch back and forth, switch back and forth. Yeah. If somebody proposed that from the get-go, like, I've got a new idea. Let's change the time twice a year. Okay. You'd think they were nuts. So we have to get off that treadmill and I think keeping Daylight savings time permanent is the right way to do it. Just two minutes. You rail against dark money whenever Republicans put a Supreme Court nominee. I rail against it, when it whenever it's up. Now there's a Democrat, uh, uh, Katanji Jackson Brown. Uh, Mitch McConnell's using your language. He talked about dark money from your side. Listen to what he's saying I and know. then you respond. <laughs> Mitch McConnell. I was just talking about some of her uh, support groups, and uh, they're always anxious to talk about groups that support our nominees, and we have a a Republican president, and what's good for the goose is good for the gander. The goose and the gander. He says well, you're doing the same thing that you've heard about. They're going to have a chance to vote to get rid of the damn stuff. Yep. And we're going to give them that chance, and I hope that this spirit of Mitch McConnell's against dark money uh, reveals itself in the votes. Ten seconds. Do you believe the red wave is coming? You don't have to worry. You're not going anywhere. But the Republicans are taking over the House. We'll see. Maybe the Senate, too. I think a strong economy, uh, a strong pressure on special interests. I think we can show a winning hand in November if we play this game with any, uh, if we play it smart. And you've been on the other side. You know what that's like. Yes. Yeah. You like it better yeah, this waves way, go both Waves go both ways. All right. Senator, you're headed back to Washington. You were up here for a little while. You're going back? Going back to uh, have the hearing for right. Judge Jackson, who Rhode Island moment. She was a clerk for Judge Bruce Selya. Yes, I know that. Who thinks very, very highly of her. I had him on. I had him on. He's very good with her.